How many hours do you study in a typical week? I've asked thousands of students this exact question in my role as a professor, and I've heard every version of this answer. One hour, 10 hours, 100 hours a week. A low number doesn't actually concern me in the slightest because that's an issue of not enough effort and that's an easy problem to fix. But 100 hours a week, a surprising number of students who study harder than anyone else in their class are still failing their exams at university and that is actually what scares me the most. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Wayne. I'm a microbiologist, science educator and the 2020 Australian University Teacher of the Year. This video is part of our new series of Tips Digests which goes back through the archives to break down a part of our previous videos with a bit more room to breathe. Today's episode will focus on the exam itself, strategies for answering different styles of questions, and how to design your revision around this approach. Let's start by taking a look back at strategies for multiple choice questions. Tip 31, red herrings. Read the question stem clearly and don't start by reading the distractors because they're designed to distract you. So read the question stem and think about the key terms, block out all the distractors, and try to recall what you already know about it. Then you can read all of the answer options. Tip 32, cheap tricks. Check if the question stem is asking for true or false, not true or not false options, and don't be fooled by double negatives. It's really very poor practice for teachers writing these types of questions, but you don't have to fall for these cheap tricks. Tip 33, generalities. Look through answer options with never and always, these tend to be wrong because there's just less chance that things are more universal that way. So read through those options first and be confident crossing them off your list. All of these early tips about MCQs are just trying to avoid unforced errors. Did it actually dive into the substance of the content or how you should study the topics? It's just about knowing the cheap tricks teachers sometimes use to write these questions. I know it's possible to write MCQs that are valid, complex, and encourage high order of problem solving. Let me tell you, it is very time consuming to do this. Unless it's a standardized entrance exam for something like medicine or passing a bar in law, most MCQs that you come across will not have gone through a rigorous vetting process. Some of us resort to logical fallacies and double negatives to build these questions. Hopefully you can spot these poorly designed MCQs from a mile away and force your teachers to up their game. Tip 34, the process of elimination. It's easier logically to find out why answers are wrong than finding all the reasons that an answer is right. There's also great validation in crossing out wrong answers, momentum and being active rather than being paralyzed by uncertainty. Tip 35, devils in the details. How different do the answer options look to each other? If there are any options that look similar to each other with one key difference, that may hide a clue for the real answer. Tip 36, is there a penalty for getting an answer wrong other than losing the mark? If not, okay to guess, don't leave any questions unanswered, but it's not great practice. There is value though in tip 37, productive failure. If it's one question that you get wrong, it's just one question. Still have a go and stay in the moment. Don't let one short-term loss or failure derail your constructive mindset for the rest of the exam. Just like it's hard to write MCQs, it's also hard to study for. Straight away, every question says, five options to consider. And although the correct answer is written on the page for you to choose from, you can't demonstrate your understanding in the same way you can with a short answer or essay question. There are no bonus marks for knowing additional details, just whether or not you knew about all five answer options. You need to study the material very broadly so that you have sufficient scope across all of the lectures, tutorials, and the worksheets that you've done. And the thing is, teachers have to fill the five answers options somehow when running the question. So you need to look in all the places that we can look as well. In this day and age, typically, this is primarily your lecture slides and tutorials. It's a little unfair to deep dive into a textbook or use some obscure research article as inspiration for our questions. Tip 38, divide and conquer. How many minutes should you spend on one single question? Divide the number of marks by the total time of the exam and work it out. Often it's one mark per minute. So for an MCQ is no more than two or three minutes per mark. Tip 39, middle ground or lack thereof. Despite what you've heard, there's no bias towards selecting option C or the middle option as being the correct answer. Most online exam platforms now randomize the answer option order anyway, so don't overthink it. Sure, you can use active recall, space repetition, and flashcards to remember everything you possibly can from all your classes, but odds are you'll miss a detail here or there and get a question wrong. I very rarely see students score full marks on the multiple choice section of an exam, but I frequently give out full marks for students 
in the short answer or essay style questions. It's for all these reasons that the tips are about strategy, answering every question if there's no penalty, being specific about how much time you spend on one single question, knowing that it's a war of attrition and you're bound to get a couple of these questions wrong. This doesn't just apply to MCQs, also to short answer questions as well. Tip 40, underline key terms in the question stem and don't rush. Do some thinking first about what you already know about these key terms. Plan out your answer logically point by point before you start writing. Tip 41, summaries matter. Cover all of the main points in your opening sentence to show the marker a preview of what your answer will be and that you've got a broad understanding of the topic. All the summarization that you've done in your notes up to that point, first, second, third pass-throughs will help with this tactic. Tip 42, know your medium. Unless otherwise stated, Dot points are perfectly fine and quicker for markers to mark and read and quicker for you to write. But this is mostly relevant for short answer questions, usually worth between two to five marks. Answer exam questions is at its core a communication task. Sure, you might know the answers, but if you can't convince your teachers of the depth of your understanding, you'll leave marks on the table. Writing out responses to practice exam questions is important as it trains you to try and communicate your knowledge in writing. Flashcards are great, but if you're verbally saying the answers to written questions, you're missing a key element of the communication medium. You might skate by in short answer questions where dot points and key terms are possible, but any problems with your written communication skills are exposed in essay style questions. Tip 43, again, know your medium. If it's an essay style, or problem solving question, then you're being assessed on how you can construct a cohesive piece of argumentative writing. Dot points won't work here, and you'll need headings, subheadings, topic sentences, summaries, conclusions. You need to know your medium. Tip 44, back to the drawing board. For essays or problem solving questions, simple revision questions in your test bank won't work. The answers to open-ended philosophical topics or scenarios won't be one word answers that can fit on a flashcard. It's much higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. We need to apply, analyze, and evaluate problem solving questions. Where you're given a scenario with some details, and you need to interpret some information. A couple of ways that you can go about this. Let's take a look. Tip 45, plug and play. If your problem solving question involves calculations, for example, there's not an infinite number of scenarios. You'll most likely have seen all of the derivatives of that question by going through past exams. What changes then and what's easy to change is the numbers associated with that calculation because teachers can swap these out and plug and play very quickly. There's no reason why you can't do the same and create an infinite pool of practice questions just by changing the numbers. Tip 46, data. A common template for problem solving involves looking at and trying to interpret a graph. This is not that easy to convert into a flashcard, so the way to get reps is to try and spot the patterns. What's on the X and Y axes? How does one change in relationship to the other? Does one go up when the other goes down or vice versa? And how much time has elapsed? Teachers don't actually expect you to be able to solve a brand new problem you've never seen before. We're looking to see if you can adapt and spot the similarities and differences between a situation you've already seen before and subtle variations in a new context. This is not easy to do by any means. It represents high order learning beyond memorizing or remembering, but it is doable, especially once you've learned how to spot the patterns. Tip 47, look to the literature. Research articles are the primary source of complex graphs and data, so use Google Scholar strategically. Find a research article published in the last five years on your topic and see if you can figure out the first piece of data and what it's trying to say. Odds are you won't be able to fully make sense of it, but again, you're looking for patterns and heuristics. The axes, the relationships, the trends, the changes over time, and that's how you get your reps. So how should you be preparing for essay style questions? The most reliable and reproducible way is to write out full practice essays in response to the topics you'll most likely encounter in the exam. Check your textbooks, past exam papers, revision question lists, and write out a full response to all of these open-ended topics. Plan out your opening introduction with an overview of three to five different sections of your essay, present your central argument up front, and summarize why each section of the essay will provide more evidence that supports your theory in different ways. For each section of the essay, have a very clear opening and concluding sentence that identifies what the nature of the argument is and finish it all off with a succinct conclusion. You don't need to win a Peabody Award for creative literary writing. You just need to make sure that all of the relevant information you know 
is presented and packaged in a coherent, readable, logical way. Tip 48, natural limits. The same philosophy applies for essay topics. Can there really be an infinite number of topics your teacher can ask you to respond to? Odds are it's a subtle variation on the same things you've been exploring over the semester, so you should build up a test bank of practice essay questions as well, each of which you've responded to and written out multiple times. Similar opening arguments, interconnected details, multiple ways of demonstrating your understanding of the same key concepts and evaluating how they compare to each other. Let's say you do this 10 times, have 10 different practice essays you've written out, probably the odds that the real exam won't have some overlap with one of these essays. Once you've written out all of your practice essays, the challenge on exam day is to really look and examine the essay topic to make a decision on which combination of your practice essays best fits what the question is asking. You should have also figured this out as part of your revision, knowing which topics go together, or provide an ounce counterbalance or contrast to each other. So you should have sections shared across multiple essay topics already. Tip 49, muscle memory. Do your practice and revision in the same way as you'll be completing the exam. If it's handwritten on paper, revise by writing things on paper. If it's an online exam, practice by typing things out. Build up your reps and take one more variable out of the equation on exam day. And that concludes this mini Tips Digest anthology on study tips. Hopefully you can use all of these strategies to reflect upon your studying and exam taking technique, especially if you've just finished all your exams for the year. Now's the time to do some difficult soul searching before you forget any hard run lessons learned along the way. The last two episodes in the Tips Digest series talked about different approaches to taking notes for class and how you can elevate your practice test taking through active recall and spaced repetition. The Bylaw Collective, I'm Jack Wayne. See you next time.